pleased and honored to be able to host Sir Lawrence Friedman uh, for a brief talk that we do regularly. Uh, I sent an email around. I don't know if everyone got it, but we're also trying this experiment where it's being streamed as a Google Hangout. So some people may or may not be watching from the web, but regardless, uh, we'll be able to save this recording for posterity. And Alice Northover, the social media manager and blog editor, is uh, manning another machine to see if we have any questions that come in that way. So it'll be a good way to make these talks just a little bit more interactive and share them with a wider audience. Uh, anyway, so let me just say a few uh, quick remarks about Professor Friedman. He's been the professor of war studies at King's College since 1982, uh, vice principal since 2003. He's written several books before this, Strategy of History, which was just published in October. Uh, he released with Public Affairs, A Choice of Enemies, America Confronts the Middle East. It won the 2009 Lionel Gelber Prize. Uh, he had written another book with OUP several years before that, Kennedy's Wars, Berlin, Cuba, Laos, and Vietnam. Uh, in 2009, he was appointed by the former Prime Minister Gordon Brown uh, on the Iraq War Inquiry to look into the UK's involvement uh, in the Iraq War. And I also sent, uh, I think it's on the poster and the email that went around, that uh, the GAP president, Tim Barton, was the initial acquiring editor for this book many, many years ago in 1994. He sent a quick remark as well. He said, I remember as a commissioning editor coming across many brilliant authors who ought to have written their version of this kind of book in their fields. Wide ranging, accessible, wise, and important, but never did. I think this is the book that Lawrence should have written, and he actually didn't. Uh, <laughs> so without any more, uh, Sir Lawrence Friedman. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. It was 1994 uh, when uh, Tim Barton commissioned me, and uh, his career has prospered and gone out, and I struggled with this book. Uh, and uh, uh, five years ago, I sort of managed to get a start of it again. Uh, but really, thanks to everybody at OUP for making it uh, come out, look good, and be, and be successful. So I'm very happy with it. Um, I want to say a little bit about what the book does. A little bit about what I think are some of the main themes. And then, in order to demonstrate that I think these main themes are, are valid, um, just talk a bit about what's been going on in Ukraine, uh, because I think it can illustrate some of the points I'm trying to make. Um, <clears throat> and I can show you just a bit about my interests, which some of the books that Jeremy mentioned may reflect. I've worked a lot on American foreign policy, as it happens, and, military strategy, but I've always been interested in policy making, and that's always given me an interest in the way that strategies are developed as a matter of practice rather than as some theoretical exercise. And though it's the case that I'm an academic writing about strategy, um, I have actually been involved in management for, for all my working career, one way or another. And um, so I've done strategy. And I, I've, I've, my last job had strategy in the title, and I've tried to write a bunch of things. Uh, so I know uh, a bit about the pitfall. So it's not written as a sort of uh, instruction manual about how to do it, though, with some ideas at the end about a way to think about doing it. Um, but it, it's, it's trying to look at the theories uh, that have developed about strategy. Uh, it's a history of ideas, of a particular idea. But I've used that to go into lots of other ideas. So there's a lot of political theory there, which some people seem to find a bit surprising. But I do try to explain what's there. Because it's basically, if you're talking about strategy, it's about the relationship of theory and practice. About your ideas of the world, about your ideas of human nature, what motivates people, how bureaucracies work, how organizations work, what are the levers that you can use to get a response from it, and how do you think about consequences. Is how do you think about cause and effect? So uh, that takes you into an awful lot of areas of social and political theory, indeed economic theory, as well as just the obvious things about Clausewitz and Jomini, or as we're looking at the business world, Michael Porter or Tom Peters, or people like that. So I've tried to go through all the various theorists, looking not only at military strategy, which is sort of my own turf, but also uh, political theory and then of the business strategy, which was sort of more of a, a revelation to me. Um, 
and, uh, and then end up with some ideas about uh, how this could be taken forward. So it's, the key thing about the book is it is a history of ideas, but informed by my, my views of the practical limitations of this exercise of strategy. One of the, um, um, the things that I, I'm, I'm most pleased about the book, which is really quite silly in some respects, was the opening quote, um, which is from that well-known political philosopher Michael Tyson, um, uh, which is, uh, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Um, <laughs> and uh, this, I mean, most reviewers have mentioned this, and um, certainly a lot of people have have been amused by it, um, because normally in this field, the quote that everybody uses is, 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 is the great Prussian field marshal von Moltke, who said something similar. What he said is, no plan survives contact with the enemy, which is basically the same thought. And the reason I opened with that was to challenge the idea that strategy is um, a plan. Most of the time when people say, we need a strategy, what, what they're saying is, we should set ourselves an objective and then have uh, work out a sequence of events, a sequence of moves that will get us to that objective. That's what people often think about. In that sense, it's a plan. Not, this is what we want to do, this is our plan for getting there. But the problem with this strategy, what makes it interesting, um, is that you're, de <coughs> you're dealing with other uh, willful human beings with their own strategies, with their own ideas, um, and their own plans. So even if you make the first move, and obviously a lot of strategies in response to somebody else's move, even if you make the first move, uh, that move itself has changed the environment. And as it changes the environment, then when you get around to making what you thought would be your second move, it's not the circumstances you were necessarily expecting. So the whole point uh, uh, to me about the way that strategy works in practice is that it's a, it is that it's a move to a new stage, um, which you hopefully be better than where you're starting from, the way you would be if you hadn't had a strategy. But it's not necessarily some distant endpoint. You should have an idea of where you're trying to go, of course. But um, a lot of it is, is about adaption, improvisation, flexibility. So at the end of the book, I use the idea of scripts as a way of talking uh, about how to develop strategy because that captures the idea that you have to think about other people's parts as well as your own. Um, and, and that, of course, sort of has this sort of slightly dramatic aspect. But if you're thinking of it in terms of drama, to me, strategy is not a sort of three-act play, uh, but a soap opera. It goes on and on and on. And one of the reasons for that, one of the reasons why uh, I, I'm sort of careful about it not being a plan with a definite end point, is even when you think you've got an end point, say you're working up to a battle in war, or an election, um, or a takeover bid, um, or a revolution, once you've done that, the strategy doesn't stop, you've just got a new situation. And you've got to be thinking about uh, how you take things to the next stage. You've got to govern the country you've just taken over, just elected. Um, so what I'm trying to do is to get over an idea of strategy as being a continual, flexible, um, adaptive, uh, and always being aware that you're dealing with other people. And that's a key part of it. The other thing that's important is that it's about power. Um, my definition of strategy is the art of creating power, which is I hope. Uh, and, the, and the idea there is you start with a sort of a pot of power, your assets, your military, your economic strength, and that what you're trying to do um, in any specific situation is apply that pot to get the maximum out of it for that situation. But you may find that though you seem to be very powerful, you've got great resources, they're not applicable to the situation at hand. So a classic way this was once put. Um, you've, got a, you've got a great hand for poker, but unfortunately you're playing, playing bridge. Uh, and that, it, it, we've all been in those sort of situations where you 
you, you know you've got great strength, which is not very helpful in these situations. Of course, in military terms, that happens very often. Uh, we, we, we all actually think of the Shah of Iran in, in, the, in the 70s. Uh, he was sort of going through military catalogs and buying everything uh, that, that could possibly uh, be available on the open market, but he didn't uh, invest in, in means of dealing with street demonstrations. Uh, so when the demonstrations came, an idea about how to cope. So it's about power, uh, but it, it's about using your resources to, to, to the greatest effect. That's what strategy should do for you. Now, if you've got lots of power, and it's sort of relevant to most situations in which you're in, it's not that interesting. Um, I mean, it, it, it's not it, it's, it's strategy still. Uh, but you know, if you if you uh, if you're if you're an archer and you, and you pull the bullseye to uh, a few feet away, you really should hit it. Um, so the, the, this isn't the enormous skill or, or interest. The sort of the lines from Ecclesiastes is about um, the race doesn't always go to the most swift and the fight doesn't always go to the most strong. Uh, but one of my favorite ever uh, comic writers, the great New Yorker, Damon Runyon, once observed, they're the ones to bet on. Um, by and large, bet on the strongest and bet on the fastest. Uh, but for the strategists, the interesting ones are the underdog. So a lot of the book, in the middle section, is called Strategy from Below, and it looks at the way that uh, 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 revolutionaries uh, try to think about strategy. And, and this is uh, somebody suggested on Amazon. I, I learned when I went on to my inquiry that I shouldn't Google myself because mm -hmm. you, you, you just. Uh, Lots of disobliging comments that you realise nobody else had seen apart from you and the person who wrote. Uh, uh, but you can't help sometimes on Amazon. Uh, and um, so I looked at, at, at so somebody was sort of suggesting this. This was sort of a baby boomer's lament for, for the lost radicalism of the 60s, which I think is unfair. But it is fair that my interest <coughs> in strategy, to some extent, was kindled during the sort of great student politics of the late 60s. Um, when I found myself talking with, um, working with people uh, who had the most extraordinary ambition for how society could be transformed and the most meager means available, uh, so it was highly unlikely that there was going to be any relationship between the revolution that they said they wanted to see uh, and what the, the resources they, they could bring to it. What was even more astonishing was not only uh, did they nonetheless persevere with strategies, they fell out with their fellow revolutionaries about the finer points of these totally impossible strategies. So um, there's something about um, radical politics that encourages people to think and talk a lot about strategy. And in one level, it's totally pointless because nothing happens uh, and they don't get anywhere. But in another way, it's been incredibly important because in wondering why the things that they wanted didn't happen, it's illuminated a lot of the big issues of social and political theory. So a lot of the questions people ask about um, how people, why is it that ordinary people think the way they think and don't think uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as a Marxist might think they should think, um, lead you into questions of consciousness. Uh, um, um, some would say forms of social control, uh, but a lot of it is just the way that um, social networks, especially in this day and age, create uh, ways of thinking that affect the extent to which people are prepared to act in particular ways. And of course, also it encourages to look at the way that the radicals themselves were thinking. So if you, you can trace a whole line of thinking which begins with these early thoughts about false consciousness or whatever, takes in the, the anti-Marxist critiques that pointed out the extent to which the elite was with a big myth or a big idea able to influence public opinion. Look at how this affected um, some of the earlier um, ideas of propaganda that wasn't to be such a nasty word. Uh, a guy, a guy who works a lot in New York, Edward Bernays, 
uh, sort of the founder of modern public relations, was all aware of these sort of theories uh, as he developed campaigns, which we would now think about being on message, getting the narrative right, and so on. So you can see these this line of thought, which ends up with the way that not only politicians now talk about their strategies, which is full of narratives, which is just a fancy word for stories, um, but also the military, when they worry about hearts and minds, uh, and how to persuade people that uh, they should support our side rather than the bad guys, because really, well, doing all the right things. And even in business too, where you're seeing a lot of emphasis now on forms of persuasion. You can't get over your big ideas just on PowerPoint, but never put a PowerPoint, um, or with lots of graphs and, graphs and figures. You've got to find compelling ways of explaining it. So I think there's all these various ideas around. Let me just make uh, two more points before I, I try to relate this to, to real events. The first is, um, if you're thinking about the strategy of the underdog, then one of the um, temptations is to work out how you can be smarter than your opponent. The woman wrote to Sun Tzu, uh, here, the Chinese uh, philosopher sage from 500 BC, who uh, may or may not have existed, um, who, wonderful aphorisms, uh, but basically it's all about being smarter, having better intelligence, being clever, being deceptive, being crafty, and working on the opponent's mind, so if the opponent thinks you're going to advance you, you're treating you think you're going to retreat you, advance you, that you weak, strong, strong, weak, the idea. Um, and it's very, you know, I often thought it was quite fun just to make up some sort of quotes and um, show people to soon to repeat them and take them as as being the words of the master. Uh, the problem is, is when you come to somebody else who's also read Sun Tzu, uh, and you're both trying to outsmart each other, and you may never actually even get. Uh, so you can outsmart, you can deceive, you can be clever. Um, but after a while, this is what people know what to expect, then um, uh, they, they anticipate it in advance, and, and they're watching you much more carefully. The other thing, what I try to uh, emphasize, is the importance of coalition. Actually, the best way uh, to cope if you're in a weak position is find a friend, find a partner, and then you will be stronger again. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the book starts with evolutionary biology and looking at primates. Uh, there's a wonderful book called Chimpanzee Politics by a chap called James Duval, who um, uh, studied chimps in, 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 in Antwerp Zoo and realized that when they, when, they, when one alpha, would be alpha male was challenging the dominant male, um, it wasn't done by brute force, by, by uh, strength. It was done uh, often by finding uh, another chimp who also was prepared to make help in this challenge. Uh, and it was often done quite deceptively or, or quite subtly, until at some point the dominant male realized he wasn't so dominant anymore. Um, coalition seemed to me to be important, but I often then made the comparison between uh, movements rather swiftly from Chimps to Winston Churchill, uh, about how when he took over as Prime Minister in 1940 in Britain, um, in a very parlous position, um, one part of what he had to do was to work out just to survive, and a lot of strategy is no more than that. Next stage is one which was still existing, was still in the game. But he understood that if it was ever going to be a victory, it wouldn't be by Britain on its own. So he started his correspondence with President Roosevelt, uh, and uh, so that when uh, Pearl Harbor happened uh, in December 41, he, he said, we've won at last. I mean, obviously, uh, we hadn't won. It took a long time before victory came. But he knew at that point there was a winning coalition in place. So they're the sort of broad ideas. Now, just let me um, say a little bit about Ukraine because it, it's relevant because uh, the big question, certainly when uh, President Putin made his first move, was 
um, is this a brilliant strategy? Is this, a, is, is this the first stage of a carefully worked out plan that's going to embarrass and eventually possibly defeat his opponents, at least in Ukraine, but possibly NATO as well? Or is it uh, a gamble which is likely to backfire? And I tend to the second of these views, although it's too early to say how this is going to end up. And you would, you would see from the way I've presented how people go about strategy. But it's not, in my view, it's, although there may be an ultimate objective in the view, the key thing is the first move, which you, your mind, may have linked to some end point, um, but may not get there because you've changed the environment by that move. So, without well, going right through the, 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 all the recent trouble in Ukraine, the basic problem for Putin which came out in his extraordinary uh, statement on Crimea last week, was that um, the country which he viewed um, as being as, as Russia being in a struggle over its future with with the European Union, uh, was suddenly moving away from it very dramatically. Uh, Yanukovych sort of hoped to be the Russian puppet in Kiev. Uh, was weak, corrupt, uh, and uh, had to flee. Uh, Russia had made an offer to Ukraine late last year um, to pull them away from the EU. Uh, uh, an offer that the EU had no intention, couldn't have, couldn't have much. But the popular opinion in, in Ukraine moved against it. So Putin found himself um, in late February in a situation where. Um, the struggle for Ukraine was risked being completely lost, uh, and he had to try to find a way of uh, reasserting Russian influence over the situation. Uh, he couldn't. The previous move he'd used was to was to offer a big loan uh, to Ukraine uh, on condition that they moved away from the EU. That option wasn't there anymore. So what he did was seize Crimea. That was a move he could make. Uh, how long that had been in preparation, who knows? But it, it really wasn't difficult. If you can't seize a bit of territory in which um, the local population, at least a good chunk of the local population, is sympathetic to you, and you actually have a very large military base there, um, then, then it's, you, know, you can't do very much at all. It wasn't uh, an outstanding military move, but it was one that could be made, and in his own terms, he could justify. Um, so he made his first move, and now everybody's wondering about what the second move is. And I think it should be already clear, and this is why I think it sort of fits with my, my theory, that if his second move was to occupy East Ukraine, um, then he hasn't made it yet. It's not to say he won't make it, but he hasn't made it yet. There isn't any momentum that's taking him into East Ukraine at the moment. It'll have to be quite a deliberate move. Now people are talking about Moldova and Transnistria, a place I last spoke about in 1993. I remember when I was signing the contract for this book. Um, that um, uh, because th there's a similar sort of situation there of a, of a Russian uh, an area which is Russian dominated, which is sort of secessionist. And maybe you could take that. I don't think that was ever part of the original plan, I'm not even sure we'll do much about it. So why, what's his problem? Well, I think one of the problems is he was expecting a different sort of reaction from Ukraine uh, itself, which has actually been incredibly restrained, uh, partly out of common sense, as there's sort of limits to what they can do, but also because of the reaction of the West, which he may have expected, um, which is, at the moment, quite trivial economic sanctions against named individuals, um, but which would probably get more serious if he didn't move into, uh, into East Ukraine. But partly because I suspect those two things he's in mind, he's now trying to work out, well, what do I do with East Ukraine? How do I get in there? What do I stop if I do go in there? What sort of forces will I need? Uh, how many will I need to hold it once I've taken it? It's not going to be that popular move. Also, there's the things that you never think about, but are now being 
rather important, like um, somebody heard somebody call yesterday the bond vigilantes. Uh, that is, uh, the Russian economy is suddenly in serious trouble because um, nobody wants to invest in it at the moment. The banks are nervous. Uh, the stock market is falling. The ruble is falling. Uh, it's got real, real issues, and um, uh, that creates uh, more anxiety in Moscow. Meanwhile, from the Western point of view, we're always, we're always look flat-footed on these occasions because, by definition, if somebody's taken an action you weren't expecting, you haven't got your responses worked out. But actually, it provides an opportunity to do something about Ukraine uh, because now do something on the economic uh, governance side, deal with corruption, which is, is a long-term and painful process, but th that option is there. So in the end, what Putin may have done is win Crimea but lose Ukraine. But one interpretation. It's not over yet. Uh, I think things could still happen on Eastern Ukraine, which would be very dangerous. The point I'm trying to do, to make, is that the elements that I've tried to emphasize have been um, in play here. Uh, there may have been an objective in mind, but the first move probably put that out of reach, um, and therefore it becomes improvisation. Everybody's kept guessing, uh, and, that, uh, 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 and that uncertainty is shaping the next moves for, for each party. That, a lot of what strategy is about is anticipating the next move for, uh, of somebody else. There's been degrees of deception and craftiness involved, for example, in the pretense that the people, uh, sort of Russian-speaking patriots rather than special forces in the primary organizing the takeover. And of course, when people now talk about this being the start of a, a new Cold War, then my basic point about coalitions comes into play. Uh, because when the last Cold War was on, um, the Soviet Union, as it then was, had a whole series of countries allied to it, what was called the Warsaw Pact. Uh, and after the Soviet Union broke up, 1991, um, all, all those countries left the Warsaw Pact. A number of countries, Baltic states in particular, left, uh, left the Soviet Union. And then that part of NATO, <clears throat> uh, if you just look at the balance, Russia now looks quite an isolated country, uh, while NATO and the European Union look quite strong. Just look at the map, it's changed dramatically. And we possibly didn't appreciate just how dramatic that change looks in Moscow. But it's one reason why whenever we're going into that, it's not like the Cold War, which was seen as being basically symmetrical, because the power balances very different. So when President Obama said that uh, Putin acted out of weakness, in many ways he was right. Doesn't mean to say he's not dangerous, but that's the basis for his action. <clears throat> so to um, just to, to wrap up, what I <clears throat> what I've been trying to argue, Sir Jeff, um, is that not the strategy always fails, but it is very difficult, and and, and Origin of strategy is the idea you could control your environment, and actually, often is not you can't. It's very difficult, and often it goes wrong. Therefore, has to be improvised, and you have to think of it in quite a fluid way. But it, you can think about it. Um, the, the, there are ways of conceptualizing the idea of strategy that allows you to think about the decisions, the choices being taken by those in charge of organisations, by political leaders. Uh, in their moments of crisis, uh, as well as when they're trying to think about how they orientate themselves in general to the environment. So I hope um, that the book is, is uh, uh, interesting in its own terms. It is a history, to, it tells tales about how these ideas were developed and thought about and the people who did it. Uh, but in the end, I also hope it, 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 it's a way of thinking about it that can actually be a practical value. On that. Jeremy, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
some literary criticism, there's economics, there's social science, history. We can speak to that and the challenge of the day, some of the perception to that approach. Sorry, people? Yeah, I mean, so the question is that it uses a lot of sources, which it does. Um, and it's interdisciplinary, so there's bits of literary theory, there's bits of political science, there's bits of economics, there's a lot of history, history of ideas, histories and policies. Um, uh, frankly, it was, the, it was the fun of the writing, I mean, I, because uh, you suddenly discover all sorts of literatures that you didn't know exist um, that are relevant to your concerns. I think there's a general lesson for academics, academic strategy more so even in the States than in the UK, is that academics uh, identify very clearly with particular disciplines. Um, and people get very nervous about moving outside those disciplines and have to make their names with the economists with the top, not in the top five journals, you're not going to make it, and they require certain sorts of theoretical, um, methodological uh, standards. Um, and it's fine. But actually, you're missing out on so much. There's so many rich literatures out there that can illuminate your, your, your uh, problems and uh, make you think differently. Um, also, what I, because my interest was in ideas and theories and how they affected practice, you know, that meant I, I was looking at you know, sort of defunct sociologists and, um, and people whose uh, work is often quite deservedly long forgotten, but were, was influential in their time, um, trying to see, understand why those ideas were influential. So, from my point of view, it was part of the fun of the book, uh, but also I think there's a point to be made that, for, uh, that, that academics should try and range outside their own disciplines. One of my heroes um, uh, is Tom Schelling, who uh, got his Nobel Prize for Economics for game theory. But actually, Schelling didn't use game theory that much. He used some of the forms of game theory. And Schelling always used Thucydides and, uh, and loved to reason by analogy in such a way that now he'd be damned by a tenure committee. Uh, it's totally um, improper methodological uh, approaches, but it just illuminated so much made people think at the time, still makes people think. <clears throat> and I think it's what academics should, should try and do. So I found it fun, but it, uh, but it, it, it does mean I've I, I read a lot of books and I've downloaded a lot of art. Yep. Yeah, so the question is about um, network, social networking now, uh, and the challenge that poses to hierarchies. Um, is that, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, well, first, a word of caution. Um, one of the chapters that didn't get written because it was really too long already, um, I wanted to look at, and I said one day I may do this still, at, at the, um, the dot com pioneers. Um, Gates and Jones and myself and all these people. Um, and what's striking about them is they were all getting on with their business um, at a time when all the management theories were starting to be influenced by those ideas of flatter hierarchies and, um, and networks and so on. I mean, maybe not imagining where we've got to now. Maybe um, you have a Google Hangout. Who would ever thought that I would be engaged in the Google Hangout? Um, but um, but, the, but the, the basic ideas were up. And from the mid 90s, a lot of these ideas were up. Actually, these guys go back a bit before that. All of them were autocrats, um, effectively. I mean, they, they, they work in teams, but all of them were incredibly strong personalities. Um, this is you no know, sort of empowerment and all these sort of things, that they were driven by a series of problems that they were trying to solve, largely engineering problems, and then saw the possibilities that emerged, and then made them happen. 
I mean, everything that's written about Steve Jobs, for example, um, it doesn't suggest he was influenced for one second by um, all this sort of swarming and networking and, and so on that his own products had helped to make possible. And then, of course, even you know, with, with sort of the great social movements like the Arab Spring and so on, which was certainly facilitated by Twitter and Facebook and so on, when the bad guys decided they'd had enough of it, they didn't sort of challenge back in, in Facebook and Twitter. Uh, they used guns, which turned out Trump's Twitter every day. Um, so um, I think it's important to be aware that this is changing lots of things. It seems much more transparent. Um, things happen more quickly. You don't. Politicians find it much harder to come manage the news, the shape concept. And if you, th I mean, despite all this sort of post Snowden stuff about 1984, we're as far away from that as you can imagine so many ways, but because there are so many sources of information, the idea of a single controlling um, focus for, for the way people think, which is the basis of all that, and the basis of so much of the stuff that was written in the interwar period, um, was used by Stalin and Hitler and, and, and the total. Now that sort of thing is gone. I mean, so recently Erdogan attempted in Turkey to close off Twitter, which led to more Twitter usage than, uh, than had been there the previous day. So something's changed and it's important. Um, how, whether it gives people power or whether it just means the medium through which power is expressed, I think it's still hard to say. Um, a lot of the things we're talking about were around before. Um, they just weren't as quick and efficient. Whether, if you look at uh, Gaddafi, no, um, Gaddafi, Khomeini in 1978, 79, the Iranian Revolution. They were passing cassettes around the mosques, got the message through that, that way. I mean, the form of social networking, not as efficient as now, but it undermined the power structure at the time. So, you know, all, all, you know in earlier periods, it would have been pamphlets. So, these mechanisms have all, always been there, but they're just more efficient. Strategy articulated in that verse, like yeah. the Arab Springs or the other Arab Springs, how, what does strategy look like in, in, yeah. in that context? Well, that's a good poor question. So, the question is about when you're using all these networks and lots of distributed individuals all sort of active at the same time, how do how does strategy work? That is interesting because um, you all have these ideas of crowdsourcing and and so on now. Um, and I find that interesting because if you look back at one of the influences uh, in the way people thought about uh, crowds and mobs, <clears throat> which is after all what we're talking about often uh, now, um, there was believed to be a special psychology at work. There's a famous writer called Gustave Le Bon uh, who wrote incredibly elitist stuff about uh, the suggestibility of crowd, which is incredibly influential um, at the turn of the 19th, 20th century, uh, shaped a lot of the way people thought about public opinion, how easily it could be shaped. But it, it was based on the idea that when individuals like perfectly sensible and rational got into a crowd, they became totally different, uh, and the demagogues and the agitators that shaped the way they think. And you still see these ideas current now. Uh, but of course the research that's been done shows it's much more complicated. Um, and a lot of it depends on local leadership and so on. So still, basically, when you have these events, somebody's still taking the lead. It may not be the person at the top of the hierarchy. You have all the various sort of heroes of the Arab Spring and, and these uh, individuals thrown up um, and whose uh, Twitter feeds are, are being followed more closely, and, and, and they see the opportunities, they articulate what it's about. Um, but, you know, if you look back and read um, about you know, the, the, the early days of the French Revolution and so on, you find similar sorts of things at work, uh, except just more localized. So what this has done is, is put on a much grander scale phenomena that always be there, but it's just bigger. 
um, and more immediate and more dramatic and more traceable. Um, you know, historians amazingly have worked out what might have been going on in the 18th uh, and early 19th century, uh, but we can trace this now and watch it happen. So it allows us, but I, I, all I'm really saying is I don't think the phenomena themselves are dramatically different to what may have been around before. But the way that they're expressed, the speed, uh, the drama, and so on, is where it's much better. We have a question from online. Here. Oh, one line question. In the current training situation, there are persistent rumors of truth movement in southern Russia. So far, none of the United States has been able to confirm that there's been any Yeah, so the question is, uh, well, you've got situations where dispositions are, aren't very well known. So this is referring to Russian troop movements reported to be happening in southern uh, Russia, below, basically across the border from eastern Ukraine. How do you deal with this? There's a really, and this was, is actually relevant to the previous question. Um, so here you have a situation, well, actually, it's quite a bit now, being watched by satellites, by so on. So um, the US intelligence, Ukraine is not very much intelligence, but US intelligence, NATO intelligence, probably knows quite a lot about it. And they can describe the number of units that there. And the thing that they'll be looking for is, um, do they have the logistical capacity, the mobility to move forward? Because if they just dumped a whole load of troops on the border, if they can't go anywhere, they're not a threat. But if they're geared to going forward, um, then they are more of a threat. So just to give you a, a previous example, in 1990, uh, when in July 1990, when Iraqi troops were on the border with Kuwait, and our President Bush Sr. was ringing around Arab leaders who were telling them it was all bluff, Actually, in the pandemic, people say, I don't think this is bluff because they've got this logistical capacity. They're, they're, this looks like a proper invasion force. So, actually, this probably looks like a proper invasion force. But then think of it from the Russian point of view. Uh, I, they want to keep their options open, but they want to intimidate the Ukrainians. They want the, the Ukrainians to think this is a real possibility. They want NATO to think this is a real possibility. So, we watch our next steps. If they want us to think it's a real possibility, it's got to look credible. Therefore, it has to have. All, all this stuff there. So if we didn't have this stuff there, then, then we could say it was bluff. Because they, because we know it's, we've got it there, all we can say it may not be bluff. We don't know, we don't know whether it's bluff or not. And that's part of the problem of interpreting it, because if you're trying to read intentions from somebody's capabilities, it's quite hard. Um, you know, you, it's like sort of standard thing where, where you're walking down a dark street and a very large guy uh, is working towards you, and he appears to be holding a, a, a baseball bat. And as you get closer, he says, Good evening, and walks past. Uh, but you've been petrified up to that point for no reason, because you've got no idea of his intention. Um, uh, but you know, paranoid is sometimes right. So um, uh, it, it just shows a problem with anticipating and understanding the opponent one thing. I don't know if this is in the book, but if you look, one of the things it is is the importance of empathy, which is very difficult with somebody who's you don't know very well, different culture and background. What is it that uh, motivates them? What is it that really matters to them? Uh, which is why, um, to some people, although what Putin said last week, he said before um, a number of times. All of a sudden, there's an insight into the way this guy thinks, and that's you know, part of what we're trying to do, as well as just look at the stuff on the ground. Questions? I'll ask one more then. Uh, I guess one thing that I thought was pretty interesting is that you were able to work in all these formats. You can write an 800 page book, you write short book reviews, you're also a prolific tweeter. Uh, I mean, do you think uh, these formats work together in a way to sort of pass along? These different ideas. Uh, I guess how you would grasp different communication tools. Well, I'm a very uh, new recruit to, to Twitter, uh, but I do find it fun. And I think actually with the Ukraine thing, 
um, when as it was breaking, you could see that's much the power of Twitter in terms of you know getting people onto the streets and so on. But they're just trying to make sense of what's going on. So in a way, they just wouldn't have been possible. You know, you're getting people um, you know, sending images from front lines, um, uh, reports from Ukrainian and Russian sources that people are translating and uh, bringing forward. Um, you're in conversation with large numbers of people who know a thing or two about these issues, putting ideas out, they're putting ideas out, and sort of consensus may start to develop, or big arguments can develop. So it, I think it's wonderful. I mean, I'm really enjoying myself. And if, you're, if you've got a book, and you know, there's no better medium for shameless self-promotion than uh, Twitter. <laughs> I mean, somebody, uh, um, uh, somebody described it as ironic narcissism. Because uh, and, and you've, you've, you've always got to be a little bit ironic while you do get people think you're a complete big head. But, uh, you know, somebody says something nice about you. You retweet it. Nobody seems to mind. Whereas, you know, for, for somebody brought up as a British self-deprecation and understatement, this is wonderful. Um, so I think it's great. Um, on, um, uh, I think I've always worked. Um, I've always been a believer. Again, this is not necessarily the case with a lot of academics. Um, in, in, in just community. Excuse me, if, you, if you're spending all your time and often being paid by the, through the public purse to um, uh, to develop ideas, to do research, why do you want to make it unintelligible um, to somebody else who might be interested? Or, you know, why are you so precious about trying to communicate it? But if you can't get your ideas over in uh, 800 words in a newspaper article, or bit more in a blog or 140 characters. Uh, that's a bit hard. But I mean, if you can't get your ideas over, um, then maybe there's something wrong with your ideas. And it's an incredibly good test you know, to strip away all, all the jargon and, uh, and um, special language and methodological uh, finer points and so on. It's a real test, I think, to to be able to find what, what, what actually is, is at the core of what you've got to say, what actually you've contributed. Um, so I've, I mean, I've always believed uh, uh, that that's an important function of academic life. If you're working in areas which people are interested in, you're, nobody's going to be interested in, in what you've got to say except other professionals, and that's fine too. But if you are, then I think it's duty, I think it's a responsibility. So I enjoy, if you enjoy writing, which I do, that, then you can work in a number of media. I think I've been spoiled a bit by people allowing me to write more books. Uh, hopefully, I should stop writing such long books. But um, uh, if you're dealing with a very big topic, then um, it just be, it just becomes too synoptic if you try and squeeze it down. But you know, I, I believe it or not, I have written quite short things in my time. Great, excellent. We can just wrap it up there. Thank you so much again, Professor.